All right, we are live. So thank you uh, everyone for joining us for today's uh, Health and Human Services uh, Committee meeting. Uh, I am Nick LeBron, the chair of the Health and Human Service Committee uh, meeting. And we have joining us uh, Councilwoman Rosetti, who is a voting member and uh, Councilman Gale, who is also a voting member. We also have Corporation Council Representative, uh, Mr. Damar Osborne and our HPA TV uh, uh, representatives. So we are live on hpatv.org, Channel 96 on Comcast and Frontier, and also uh, streaming live on Facebook. So we are waiting for uh, the Director of Health and Human Services, Liani Arroyo, uh, so that we can begin the uh, meeting. Uh, in the meantime, thank you, uh, Councilman Josh Mictum, uh, for joining us for today's Health and Human Service meeting. And um, Happy New Year to all while we wait. John Gale and I are both outside. Uh... Don's at his front lawn, and I'm down by the train station. <laughs> oh, and Nick's a, outside, too, at the riverfront. Want to have a snowball fight? Yeah, really, let's. Virtual. There you go. Get that going. Don't put a rock in the middle of it like my brother used to do. Oh, my God. <laughs> Boys, back then. Incorrigible. Still is. <laughs> Have you heard from Liani, uh, Councilman LeBron? She just texted me, so I am going to see how I can help her get on. Okay. I know I, I had some difficulty joining. Hello, Councilman Clark. Hello, Happy New Year. Wow. Happy New Year. That really is that really Majority Leader Clark? Because it didn't sound like it. It is I. Thank you for okay. the call, Councilwoman. Sounds Councilman. like an imposter. I think it's not yeah, you. Thank you for the call. Uh, for the call. Thank you for the card as well. Oh, you're welcome. I love cards. I write them all myself. <laughs> Oh, There's Councilman, Councilman Mixed them's in his house. We're all outside. I guess you're inside. We're all. <laughs> Burr, it's so cold out here. Josh, you look nice and warm. What do we think is going to happen in Georgia tomorrow? Oh, God. I want to say it's uh, going to be a democratic sweep. I'm taking that. I'm taking that to the bank, Majority Leader. The the Hope it is. Then maybe maybe somebody's head will explode. Yeah. Ooh, did I say that? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just about there. Okay, hold on. Let me see is here. Coming? Yep, there's somebody waiting. Because uh, I have to. I have to go off to another call at six thirty. Okay. Is that you, uh, Director Arroyo? Yes, it is. I just All right. She is. Yes. Yay, All right. Director yes. Arroyo. <laughs> no problem. And uh, we also have with us uh, Councilwoman uh, Wilderlis Bermudez. Thank you for joining us today. All right. So we have one uh, major item on the agenda, and I think it's on the top of everyone's mind. And so, uh, Director Arroyo, with the uh, COVID vaccine distribution update. I know we touched on it a little bit before the holidays, but um, there's been so much information since then, we felt it was pertinent for you to update the community on uh, where we are. Great. Um, well, there is always lots of information and the information um, doesn't change hourly anymore, but it does change every couple of days. So I'm going to give you an update that is valid as of today. Um, it may shift and change a little bit but um you know we here at the city of hartford had uh have been planning for a number of months to um, get ready for vaccine rollout 
I think as everyone is aware, the vaccine is rolling out in phases and these phases are determined at the federal level through the Centers for Disease Control's um, Advisory Committee, Committee on Immunization Practices or commonly known as ACIP. Um, so ACIP determines sort of the phase, well, determines the phases and who's included in those phases. And then we as a state um, at the state level will then make determinations if we're gonna follow all of the ACIP recommendations or modify them. And so the state is discussing that right now, the vaccine committee that the uh, governor did put together has been discussing the uh, ACIP recommendations for phase 1B. And so we're expecting to get additional uh, guidance on phase 1B uh, sometime this week is what we've been told. So we're hoping that that is the case. But let me just give you um, an overview in terms of where we're at and in, in terms of our preparation and uh, where phase 1A is happening right now. The city originally was not going to participate in phase 1A. We had um, basically had been told by the state because the expectation for phase 1A was the Pfizer vaccination. Uh, most health departments, really no health department in the city uh, here or at the state really had the capacity to take on that sub you know, that sub freezing or ultra cold storage um, and handling of the Pfizer vaccine. But with the advent of the Moderna vaccine coming on board, uh, health departments were asked if they wanted to participate in phase 1A. Our participation was really to help um, move the process along of phase 1A um, more quickly um, at the state level so that we can get through phase 1A and move to phase 1B in a more expedited fashion. I think everyone's heard that the state is doing really, really well overall on, <clears throat> on vaccinations. Uh, uh, and so there are several health departments who are vaccinating and assisting in their local municipalities with vaccination. Uh, we've been moving towards that. We're in a little bit of a different situation here in the city because we do have so many resources in the community that are vaccinated in phase 1A. And again, just a reminder that phase 1A are um, healthcare workers, uh, our nursing home population, and um, other first responders. And so our hospital system has been uh, taking the lead, both hospital systems in the city have been taking the lead on vaccinating those individuals. Now with the advent of the Moderna vaccine, our uh, local FQHCs have also taken in uh, delivery of the Moderna vaccine and have also started vaccinating uh, additional individuals, healthcare workers and first responders. And so we continue to move towards uh, being ready for that. We have been working with the state to ensure that all of the uh, uh, freezer capacity, refrigerator capacity, refrigeration and things like that on our end have been taken care of. And so uh, we had a little glitch last week with a, a device that is set to read the temperatures on our refrigerator. That's been taken care of. So we are looking forward to and just awaiting final word from the state of whether we'll be able to put it in order for vaccine this week. So that's where we're at here. Um, that vaccine would be Moderna. That will only be for phase 1A recipients, which at this case would be any remaining healthcare workers. Uh, and any first responders, uh, medical first responders that are still looking for vaccine. So, and there are still some individuals in those groups still looking for vaccine. So that's where we're at right now. And we're looking to augment the capacity of the current providers um, in this phase, not to be a primary vaccine provider in phase 1A. Now, phase 1B, we believe that's where we have more of a niche in terms of being able to reach populations that are not always reached by the established medical system and medical providers in the state. But also uh, we do know here at the city from our experience to our clinic, there is a subset, subset of Hartford residents that really trust the health department and the work that we do. And we come to those individuals in a variety of ways. Some of them are through our WIC office and our WIC services. Uh, so we have access to individuals um, in that in that way, which is very helpful. They have a trusting relationship with us already. We also have a number of individuals that we work through through our health clinic. Um, through our um, our clinic is is mainly focused on uh, STIs, STDs, and providing treatment for that for individuals 
who may fall through the cracks or have fallen through the cracks or lack uh, health care, uh, health insurance. Um, so we have a sub a subsegment of individuals there. And then uh, the other part is working with our seniors as well. And through COVID, we've actually been able to develop more relationships with senior communities, uh, senior living communities. So many of our senior housing units, we've brought testing directly to those senior housing units rather than expecting our seniors to come out and get tested for COVID in the community. We've been working with providers here with our FQHCs to bring testing to those communities. And so we think in phase 1B, that's where we will play a much larger role. Uh, that was the role that we were preparing for um, until the state said, hey, you know, we can use some help on phase 1A. And we accelerated our preparations for uh, to be ready to accept vaccines sooner than we had originally intended. So we are currently um, taking inquiries from uh, senior our senior housing communities. Uh, we are working together uh, with a team here at the city. We do have a team um, that is working on this to set up our vaccination plans for phase 1B. Um, our thought is that we will be going out to these communities to vaccinate them, not waiting for seniors to come to us. We don't want to see, unfortunately, what has been happening in Florida with seniors waiting in long lines. Uh, we will work with our housing housing directors that we've worked with through uh, with rental rebate to work with them to help us uh, do appointments at each individual location. Um, and that we hope to use what we've learned through COVID testing as a model. So partnering with the faith community, partnering with CBOs, um, partnering with the senior living um, housing directors to be able to reach those individuals where they're at. And that's, I think, a, a huge lesson learned. Uh, we can have multiple access points for individuals. The city itself has 12, I think now it's 13 because the new site just opened, but 13 standing COVID testing centers. And we still have to do a lot of outreach to get people to get tested. It's not something that if you build it, they will come. You have to build it, and then you have to have people out there reaching out to folks and inviting them to come get tested. And so that's how we're going to view this. We do have the team of CHWs as well. We're going to be transitioning them over the next two weeks to continue with COVID education because that still needs to happen. Even though we have a vaccine, we still need to um, inform people about COVID. We still need to encourage them to get tested. And now we're going to start educating them about the vaccine. We, um, in preparation for phase 1B, we are also going to be embarking on a media campaign. Um, that media campaign will be based on conversations that have occurred with community members here in the city of Hartford, uh, individual consumers, individual residents, as well as uh, grass tops leaders in the community as well. And so we did seven focus groups, spoke to over 100 individuals um, and have developed, uh, are developing some messaging with the help of a marketing agency that those messages will be tested again with community shortly. And we're looking to have one place where all this information can be found that's Hartford specific. So all of those things are ongoing. They will be ready uh, in preparation for phase 1B where there's a larger group of people that will will be um, able to access the, the vaccine, including our public schools. And so we've already met with our public schools, uh, with our uh, health coordinators at both of the two large school systems. And then we'll be reaching out to our charter school systems as well in the upcoming week. Um, but we have started with Heart for Public Schools and have started also with CRAC to ensure that we are working with them to get their uh, staff vaccinated, uh, teachers and staff in buildings vaccinated as well. So those, that's all the preparation that's happening. Lots of moving parts, things change. Um, like I said, it used to be on almost hourly basis. Now it's at least every couple of days, but that's the latest update. We still don't have a definitive answer as to who exactly phase 1B will include other than the sort of general um, buckets of individuals that we've talked about, which are municipal workers, essential critical infrastructure workers in the municipality. So that's gonna include um, probably some of our DPW staff, as well as obviously fire and police and likely other key staff in the city, uh, individuals over age 75, teachers, staff within school buildings. Um, those are some of the people that were included 
in uh, phase 1B. And so we're making our plans to augment that and bring clinics to the community rather than setting up clinics and expecting people to come to us. Thank you, uh, Director. So I want to uh, formally introduce uh, Councilwoman Surgeon for joining us uh, today and uh, Council President President uh, Mally Rosado. Um, so we're going to start with our questions. Uh, Council President, uh, the floor is yours. I believe you have a question. Thank you, and to you, Mr. Chair. Hello, everyone. Hi, Leanne, how are you? Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you. I, I apologize, I got on the meeting late and I don't know if you covered this section, but um, my concerns are about the uh, nursing homes. So um, I don't know if you covered uh, that vaccinations did start in Hartford. Yes, vaccinations I believe have started. I will confirm my understanding is that by the end of this week, we will have um, not just in the city, but statewide, all of the nursing home residents will have been vaccinated. But I will confirm uh, that all of ours, if they've already received it, but I will confirm that. My understanding, it was in progress. Okay, thank you. And, and that process is not, just, just want to be clear, that process is not being administered by us. Um, that process is coming through the federal government. The federal government instituted contracts with Walgreens and CVS um, to to manage that system, and my and most of the nursing homes in the state selected CVS to provide that. I do know they 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 are happening. My own grandmother is in a nursing home in uh, in Fairfield County, and she received her first dose last week. Yes, and my, my father also is in a nursing home, and he did receive his um, last week. That's what why uh, it prompted the question to me if our um, you know. Nursing home residents are are um, are getting them since you know our nursing homes were highly affected um, by the COVID. So I, I will wait. I will most definitely to... confirm. I, I, I will confirm for you. I feel pretty confident that they've started, but I'll confirm if they finished. So, um, uh, Director Royal, just piggybacking on that question: um, If there is a delay in a particular nursing home, is it more due to um, operations within the building, or is it more due to distribution? It's likely due to, to scheduling and when shipments come in. That a lot of this has to do with how many doses are coming in, what, you know, if it's the, the correct amount of doses. And I think you all heard there was some, some delay in some doses of Pfizer. I know this week there's been a little bit of a um, less Moderna vaccine came in that the state was anticipating, but the state is about three weeks ahead of time in terms of vaccinating the nursing home. I believe they expect the nursing homes would be done by the end of this month, but they got enough supply that at the end of this week, every nursing home resident in the state of Connecticut would have received one dose. Okay, so, there are so still people yeah. getting vaccinated this week, just to be clear. Right. I will confirm if, if, if any of our particular um, nursing homes, I will confirm that, but there are still people being vaccinated this week. Fantastic. And just to um, just so, because um, I'm looking at a lot of my council colleagues and I'm sure they're all getting hit up just as much as I am in terms of the senior centers. Um, when should we raise the alarm with any particular place? Like when should we, you know, re raise the red flag as um, when they haven't received it? You're saying that, the, and if I hear you correctly, you said that all, all nursing homes should have at least done the first dose by the end of this week, correct? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. And again, okay. that entire process, just to be clear, is, was handled by the federal government. We had nothing right. in terms of the day-to-day -to, -day to do with that. Um, nursing homes made their orders through uh, through CVS. They selected their vendors, CVS or Walgreens, mm -hmm. and CVS and Walgreens contacted them and uh, made arrangements for their appointments. Thank you. Uh, Councilman LeBron, through you, I, I have another question. Sure. And so, so um, Director Arroyo, uh, just to be clear, and I apologize again if you answer this question, so am, am I understanding correctly that the city of Hartford, the health department is not involved at all with the distribution of this vaccine? At this point in time in phase 1A, in this week, the answer is no. 
the expectation was that all health departments would be online for phase 1B. That's what we were working towards. We accelerated our preparation and we are able to take a shipment of vaccine. Our expectation is that we will be ordering, but that vaccine will only be for those in phase 1A, which are healthcare workers and first responders. Those will be the only individuals that we would be able to vaccinate. And the nursing Mass homes. Vac no, we, we, won't, we do not vaccinate nursing homes. That's done through CVS okay. or through Walgreens. So Whatever I, vendor okay. the nursing home selected. Okay, so my, my, my concern is, and I don't know if this is, uh, you've uh, addressed this, is what, what happens with someone who's undocumented? What happens with someone who doesn't have an elderly person that doesn't have medical insurance? What happens with someone that doesn't speak English? Are those protocols okay. put in place? That, okay, let, let, let's, I just wanna take a step back. Mass distribution of vaccine will likely not happen until late spring. Okay, there's not enough vaccine to vaccinate all these individuals at this point in time. As a result, the federal government has taken a phased approach. There's different phases. Phase, we used to just have phase 1A and 1B. Now we have phase 1A, phase 1B, and phase 1C. And there is a phase two as well. Currently, we are still in phase 1A. Phase 1A is three weeks old. No one in the general public at this point in time is being is able in theory not going to say that you know folks might not you know you never know right you we've been seeing across the nation that people that are not in phase 1a is vaccinated we have no reports of that in the state of Connecticut which is great but phase 1a is only for those three groups of individuals healthcare workers first responders and individuals in nursing homes so those are the only folks that are getting vaccinated right now our expectation is that at the end of this month, we will expand that to include school staff, essential municipal workers and other essential workers and individuals over the age of 75. If the state of Connecticut decides to expand that, then more groups will be included in that. But that's who we have thus far and that's who we're preparing to uh, do clinics for uh, to help vaccinate those individuals. That's where we will play a much larger role. People that are undocumented will have access. That is the point that we are working through here at the city, working through our uh, CHWs, identifying, uh, you know, we know the groups that are working with uh, undocumented individuals. Once we know uh, in terms of the larger availability of that, we will have many more meetings as we're getting more closer to each phase with individuals of each of those groups to help us do that outreach, to ensure that if folks don't feel comfortable coming to the health department, if we know that there's a community in a particular neighborhood of individuals who are undocumented, who are working with a particular group or working with a particular church, we will work with those individuals to ensure that we have trusted partners and work hand in hand to either do clinics on site or work with them to bring them into our clinic to help provide those doses. My, my priority is ensuring that those individuals who are least likely to go and enter a healthcare center are the ones that we're focused on. And what we've seen is our elderly population, they've been afraid to leave their homes during COVID. And I'm not gonna ask them to leave their homes to go get vaccinated, we're gonna come to them. If we have individuals that are undocumented, if they're, I mean, we know we have individuals that are undocumented, but I'm just saying like groups of people aligned with different groups, you will work with those groups. And I will most certainly reach out. I know that Council in Bermudez does a lot of work with mutual aid and, and all. so I understand those relationships and I will be reaching out as we get closer to when we know that we have the doses available to vaccinate those communities. But right now, the first two phases, the first phase is very limited. The second phase will become larger and the third phase in uh, phase one, one C will probably be the largest. And then after that, we're looking at wider spread community distribution. Thank you, Director Arroyo. Mr. Chair, I'm all set with my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. Councilwoman Surgeon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and Happy New Year's to everyone. And I hope 2021 is gonna be a way better year than 2020. So glad to see everybody is alive and safe. Um, 
couple questions for you. Let me find my notes here. Sorry. Uh, there was a couple, you talked about a team that you have together who are putting together a plan for you regarding how we're going to roll out the testing. Who's on the team and when does the team meet? So the team that we have, we have a program, uh, a program administrator, uh, Delita Daniels. She just came on board with us. She's been with the city, but she just moved roles. Um, to work with us, so she's working with us. Our nurse supervisor, Monique Dunstan, our uh, new public health nurse, Nancy, whose last name I unfortunately cannot remember. And then we have a, uh, six CDC nurses, some of whom are bilingual, that are working with us as well. And they have all are in the process of being trained. The group basically is in communication every day. That is Delita, myself, and Monique are in communication every day. We've not started larger meetings yet because right now we're trying to get all the finishing touches on the initial stuff for phase one, for phase 1A to be able to accept that those vaccines hopefully next week. Uh, but that's, that's who the team is right now. And that team has different members that come in and out depending on expertise in the department. So currently our public health preparedness coordinator, uh, who helped with our flu clinic and drive through flu clinic, our exercise, as well as vaccinations, is, a, is also helping the team, is also helping the team um, because of her knowledge of drive, drive through flu clinics. She's going to be integral of working with us to do drive through COVID vaccination clinics. Great. And you also, that you also mentioned um, that you, there's a media campaign that you're going to be developing and there's a marketing agency. Um, and you said you did some focus group uh, information. Would yes. you talk a little bit more about that for me, please? Sure. So we did uh, we did a series of focus groups both on flu and COVID. And uh, the general questions for both were, what do people know about flu or COVID? Um, where did they hear it from? What do they want to know? Uh, who do they need to know it from? What would uh, what do these people need to say in order to uh, move you to get vaccinated, both for COVID and or flu? Um, and so, what we found on the COVID side were a couple of interesting things. There, you know, there are still some individuals in our community who are distrustful around COVID, just period. Uh, you know, sort of that COVID COVID deniers that. COVID doesn't really exist. It's a very small number of the over 100 people that were that were a part of these groups, but there were still some individuals who felt, you know, unsure whether COVID was even real. Uh, and in one of those groups, what we were told uh, by the focus group leader was there was an individual who had battled COVID and had gotten pretty sick and then shared their story, and that seemed to change the tide. So that was a learning for us. So we're, we're reaching out to individuals that um, or have or will be starting to reach out to individuals who have had COVID and may want to share their story. So we've had that. What we're hearing also is that there's concerns about how quickly this vaccine was done. So we know that we have to do work and explain why this vaccine was done quickly and give people the information and knowledge about why it's still safe, even though it was done quickly, because there there are you know several things science that existed previous to this that was leveraged for this vaccine. So that's one thing. The other thing we heard is that they want to see the politicians get vaccinated first. If uh, if this vaccine is safe, they want to see they want to see those individuals get vaccinated first. So you know that is a part of what we want to do. We want people to see see um, see notable people that are eligible be vaccinated. Uh, publicly, because if we think that helps instill confidence, my plan is to get vaccinated publicly when when I'm able to. So those are some of the things that, that we've heard. The other thing is that people want Hartford accessible, like Hartford specific information. And so we'll be developing a landing page that will serve as a resource for our community on all things related to information about vaccines generally how they're created, the process by which they're created, information about uh, the COVID vaccine specifically, particularly mRNA technology, because lots of uh, 
folks, not necessarily in these groups, but um, in other places have come up and have had conversations or have concerns about mRNA technology, which is what was used to produce these vaccines, uh, address some of those issues about this particular vaccine. And then continue to update the information. I think you're all aware there are several vaccines that are in development in different phases. Some are mRNA, some use more traditional methods. And so we will update that information so that people know. And then where they can get vaccinated. We are in a very um, unique situation here in the city in a very good situation, I would say, where we have two major hospital systems and we have five federally qualified community health centers. Um, we know that several of those federally qualified community health centers have already accepted shipment of the Moderna vaccine and have started vaccinating um, healthcare workers. Uh, so that's that's one thing. Other Other municipalities don't have as many access points for the vaccine. So we feel very lucky about that. Um, and we do know that some of these federally qualified community health centers, several of them came up in conversations as trusted sources of care. So these are faces that we wanna work with and leverage, including uh, working with doctors in their facilities to ask them to participate as part of this campaign as well, to show that there's trust, to show that people that are seeing our community on a regular basis for non-COVID related illnesses and issues uh, are talking to them about COVID as well. So those are some of the learnings that we had. And those are some okay. of the learnings that we're starting to apply to what's being developed at this point in time. All right. Just um, through you, Mr. Chair, can I have one more question? Of course. <laughs> um, thank you. Faith-based faith organization. How are we working with them as uh, one of the groups of people which are trustworthy uh, in our community? Uh, have you started so, working with these yep. groups? Yet? Yes, we actually started with the flu work that we've been doing. We've been working with the Ministerial Health Ministerial Alliance. Um, and so we started... Uh, reestablishing many of those relationships around the flu. So we've done a couple of flu clinics uh, working in partnership with faith-based community. We've also worked with some of our faith-based community on COVID testing as well. So we are, are, we'll be bringing them into the fold as we get more information. Again, that they're going to be more um, useful Another phase in many ways. It, yes. And, and once we do more of the widespread distribution, but we still view them as an integral partner now because we know that we need to have some of those folks talking about it. And so our CHWs will start conducting more outreach to them um, and, and offering their services for presentations because we view this work right now over the next two to three months of sort of seeding, seeding the community, letting them sort of planting all those seeds of information so that people can can learn more, can seek out their own trusted sources, but really have a place and a base of information that's coming from the city and that they can turn to the city for that information. Great. Just, and that when they're eligible for vaccination, they can feel that they have the information to freely made a choice to be vaccinated. I'm sorry, you're hearing my daughter in the background where my husband and I are tag teaming. I'm, I'm a health director, but I'm also a mom. Your mom first. No, your mom first. Um, you my four-year-old in the background. Apologies about that. Oh, no, no, no. I think it's perfect. Don't apologize. Yeah, no definitely apologies. don't apologize. Absolutely not. I've decided my grandson looking over my shoulder listening. Um, thank you. Thank you. No, no, no. Um, you know, one of the things I just want to offer to you, uh, Leon, is that you know, you have council people who are extremely active in their community. So uh, if we can be of any help as far as working with faith-based or uh, faith-based organization, you know, when you have these team meetings or getting information out, um, I'm going to volunteer myself to really get more actively involved in that. Also, I would love that. I would love that. And I would love to establish a more of a task force type um, group and so please that's where I was you'll, heading you'll hear from me in the next you'll hear from me in the next week or two around around yeah. that please. you will hear from us we're that's what we're moving towards okay we just what needed to we, since we accelerated phase 1a we have to put that on on the back burner for a couple Understandable. Weeks to just have that but we're I think we're at a good spot and we right before the holidays we discussed internally as a team 
setting up yeah. a more formal task force to work with you all. Yeah, because you know how difficult it was trying to get people to come out and vac- get vaccinated. I mean, Absolutely. you know, to be tested. And so I think the uh, education is going to be twice as hard um, for Absolutely. the plus factor as far as getting the vaccination. And I think we can help um, the city, you know, reach out uh, to those group of people. Anything else? Um, one of the things I think I heard you talked about was um, you. they said there was about 13 standing testing sites. Are you planning on having people going into a lot of these seniors who are uh, home um, bound? How are we going to get to them? We just talked about that today, actually. So um, I have a grant that we, uh, it's passed through funding, but we had to submit a formal write-up. Um, you've all, you all, that got, it's gone through council already. So we're just working with the state on details, um, specifically about the funding. But one of the things I did talk about with my team was going to our homebound seniors that are homebound seniors may be homebound, but the people taking care of them are not and mm-hmm. have, you know, have the possibility. So, uh, you know, we did work with one, um, one community provider of in-home nursing services for COVID testing in terms of helping us register folks. So we will likely reach out to that um, agency. It's, it's a Hartford agency to see if they can partner with us to do exactly that, to work with those when we have, uh, if, we have if they have seniors and people that they're working with that are over 75, that need to be vaccinated, that we can work with them to do that work. So that actually was just the topic of conversation earlier this afternoon. Great. That, that's been on my mind. And if you have people that can go into the churches and do vaccination at, on a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning, that's something you could pl- you could possibly put in your plan. Yes. And, and we're, we are looking at that. You know, one of the things that we want to do is obviously make sure we're hitting Hartford residents first. So uh, making sure that we're partnering with churches uh, that that have large Hartford congregations. And we know there are quite a few of those um, and, you know, some larger ones, some smaller ones, but it's something that, that we're looking into. Again, it's all about the phases. So that right. might not be something appropriate in phase 1B. It may be something that's more appropriate, uh, or in phase 1, it may be something that's more appropriate Absolutely. for phase 2. Just putting some things on the table, some ideas on the Absolutely. table. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you. I thank appreciate Thank you so it. very much. <laughs> thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilwoman Surgeon. I think, is there any other, uh, qu- I know Council President has another question, but I want to open up to the floor. Does anyone else, uh, my colleagues, have a question? Councilwoman Bermudez? Thank you. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. My, my question was, um, since we're hearing that there's a second mutation of this virus, how does that impact the current vaccines that are available? Mm-hmm. So we, we just don't know really yet how it will. Um, I actually spent some time this weekend listening to, um, I think it was a podcast, if I recall, um, that was talking about coronaviruses and coronavirus and their mutations. And depending where the mutation happens, um, whether they believe that this vaccine will work. And all indications, at least from a theoretical level, is that this vaccine will still have some effectiveness against this mutation because of where the mutation is and and what spike protein it is, um, if I'm using all the correct terminology here right now. But um, that was, again, but it's still, we just don't know. I mean, we're going to have to see how it all plays out in in terms of what's happening right now with people getting vaccinated. We, that that uh, mutation is likely here. It's not the first time that the virus mutated. Um, it is my understanding from the first surge that we had that the um, the virus, the, the coronavirus that was here um, on the East Coast was different than the West Coast. And there was some thought that it was more virulent on the East Coast, which is why we saw that huge surge, particularly around in New York and in Connecticut earlier. Uh, so it, the mutations will happen, but they believe that at this point in time, theoretically, that the vaccine will offer some protection. I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that the 
the CDC or I think it was FDA, I can't remember, came out saying they would accept a vaccine with 50% effectiveness and the current two vaccines are 94 and 95% effective. And so even if the effectiveness wasn't as high with this new mutation, it would still, it would still be, you know, at this point in some ways better than nothing. Um, but if it's over 50%, the FDA will still, will still move forward on approving it as well. Councilman Ramirez, are you all set? Thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, Majority Leader Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chief. To you, uh, Director Arroyo, Happy New Year uh, to you. Happy New Year. Um, can you just uh, speak to uh, the new testing site that has uh, uh, going to be located uh, in the city's North Meadows? And uh, also to uh, just let us know where the where are you seeing the hotspots uh, still in the city of Hartford? Sure. So the new testing site um, just opened at, at the Xfinity parking lot. We use that to do testing um, earlier with Charter Oak as well as doing flu vaccine clinics. So, um, you know, it's a site. It's, not necessarily the best site in terms of accessibility, but we do know that there's a bus line that runs there. Um, you know, it, for those that drive, you know, access off the highway, it's not meant to be a Hartford only site. It is a site that's meant to serve the region. Um, but we did work with, with the um, state to ensure that um, certain things that would make it easier for our community uh, would be a part of this. And one of those things is allowing walk-ups so walk-ups will be allowed there. Now, again, not super convenient, but they are allowed. It is it is on a bus line. Um, we uh, push for expanded bilingual speakers there, particularly Spanish, um, Spanish speakers as well, and the state and the testing partner have agreed to that. So this site is being run through a uh, through a grant um, by the state through an organization called CIC. They're out of uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. They are related to the Broad Institute. Uh, they were doing testing for higher education. Many of the, I'm sure you all know, many of our colleges and universities were testing two and three times a week and getting quick turnaround tests, 24 to 36 hours, um, between 24 to 36 hours. Um, and so these, uh, this particular uh, organization, CIC, uh, expanded its offer, expanded its services to not just colleges and universities, but to, um, to state governments and municipal governments. So they have been setting up testing sites in the Northeast um, and they are they set up three testing sites in the state of Connecticut to continue to augment. Uh, it's my understanding that they will be priority testing sites for our um, school staff. So school, uh, school staff, including teachers and others that work in schools, paraprofessionals and support staff um, will have priority access here. At, the, at this particular testing site as well. So that is, that's what we know, it's open seven days a week. Uh, it, it will be open until later in the day, till 7.45 in the evening to be able to capture more individuals. Um, we wanna see what those late evening hours, and it is also open Saturday and Sunday, I believe for five or six hours. I don't have the exact times in front of me, but it is a state contract. The state um, approached us and asked us if we were interested. And we of course said, absolutely, we want it here in the city of Hartford. It expands our access and expands the access um, to, to many individuals and gives more options for folks to be able to get tested in our community. Great. Uh, Council President, uh, uh, Majority Leader Clark, I, I think, are you done with your questioning, sir? And I just wanted the director to uh, talk to us about where she's seeing spots with oh, oh, the spikes. The yes. Spot. Yes. Hot, yes. So, um, so our hotspots have and continue to be uh, Frog Hollow and uh, Sheldon Charter Oak neighborhoods. We've um, those are those two zip codes continue every once. I, mean, I think last week, um, I believe Northeast or Clay Arsenal popped up. I have to double check the, the zip code. We had three zip codes that popped up, and I believe it was. Play, I can't remember if it's Northeast or Clay Arsenal, um, also popped up for us. Um, we have seen a, a huge decrease in numbers again, which is great. We had a very large post-Thanksgiving spike. Those numbers have come down. Um, 
but that's that's where we see see the numbers. Um, again, the Latino community has um, been very hard hit. This sort of second surge, the our initial surge, was very much, I believe, focused on our African American community. Um, as, you know, obviously, given the the nature of many of the jobs. Um, you know, home health care and those types of jobs that many individuals in our community were uh, doing um, at the, in the first surge in many of the places where uh, I think a lot of our Latino community were working in were likely closed. But now as things have reopened, we've seen it sort of flip to uh, a large number of our infections amongst the Latino community, definitely overrepresented um, past the 40 some odd percent that they represent of Hartford. We're seeing upwards of the data that we have. Not all of our um, testing data comes in with race and um, race ethnicity identifiers, but for the data that comes in, it's always um, over 50% of those of that is uh, Latino. And when for the other 50% that doesn't have race uh, race ethnicity identifiers, when we start calling them, my epi believes it's probably closer to 70% of our cases are amongst Latinos and oftentimes no known source of infection, but then it's because of the, the larger multi-generational households um, and really multi-generational households are a fixture of, of all, all communities pretty much here in the city of Hartford, but the larger families on the Latino side um, and more households oftentimes living under one roof, we will then see the entire household get sick because of that. So that's what's that's what we're seeing in, in, in the numbers right now. Thank you, uh, Council President. Uh, yes, through you, Chair. Um, so Director Arroyo, I, I made actually made got off the uh, screen and got made a phone call to Trinity Health on Hillside Avenue. And I don't know if you can answer this question for me, but they did tell me that yes, that they received the vaccines last week and that actually they're gonna get the booster this week. So that's that's great news. However, the nurse there said to me that she's very concerned because only 50% of the nurses agreed to, to get Be vaccinated. vaccinated. Yeah. So my, yes. my, my question is, and I can't remember um, if, if, for example, Hartford Hospital, um, the nurses and doctors, first responders, was it mandatory to get the vaccine? So my question is, is would it be mandatory for the nurses at the nursing homes get vaccinated or not? At this point in time, it is not mandatory. And I do not believe, I'm not, I don't believe that any of the healthcare systems have made it mandatory, but I will follow up on that. Okay, thanks. Um, my, understa my understanding is that every everyone right now has felt that it should be voluntary. There's a lot of... Um, you know, fear and hesitation around this vaccine. And I personally believe that the best way to overcome that fear and hesitation is to show that it works. Okay. And so, um, you, and, and when we think about our nursing home, we think about the, the mainly women that work there. They are mainly depending, you know, more of the, a lot of the skilled nurses are a lot of our West Indian population. Um, a lot of the nurses' aides and, and techs and things like that are um, a lot of our African-American and Latina women. Um, I, I would feel very uncomfortable saying it has to be required for them. And I understand, again, my own grandmother's in a nursing home. I understand that um, many of us have relatives in nursing homes and we will want everyone vaccinated because that's how it's getting in. But I just, I think we need to get people there. And that's what part of us doing this outreach uh, with the CHWs, with the media is a way to get people there. We need to show that it works. And today the state did announce uh, that uh, they, they put together a PSA for our nursing home workers, not just here in Hartford uh, are saying that they don't wanna get vaccinated, it's across the state. So they're putting some, um, some media behind that to uh, get their own peers to talk about being vaccinated and why they did it and sort of use that method to try and increase those numbers. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm all set. Thank you, Dr. Arroyo. Sure. Uh, opening it up to the floor. Uh, any other council colleagues, do you have any questions? Councilwoman Sergio, you have a question? 
Are you on mute, Councilwoman Sergi? Thank you. Director, a couple more things I need to follow up on, and that's your, the media and your marketing campaign. Who are you using? So um, we we worked with we worked with um, sorry with the Latino Way, and um, they, like I said, spoke to over 100 people. About 40 48 percent of them were Latino, and 30 some odd percent were African American, and then the rest were a mix. And they did speak to young people because I, I did want many young people to be a part of this. I felt it was important. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna go there. Okay. No, 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 no. no. I'm talking. Sorry. <laughs> Please don't apologize. We're all let's, there's a lot of moms and dads around here. That is so true. And you know the funny part of the whole thing, director is they don't pay attention until you start doing something. No, exactly, exactly. It was mm -hmm. nice and quiet until I got on the phone. Oh, that's normal. <laughs> um, that's funny. So. <laughs> We're using, like I said, you know, we, we had received funding for flu and flu, obviously, it's, it's, flu has been very low this year, right. um, but through, you know, we're still pushing, going to do a little bit of a push on the flu vaccine as well, um, but we will be using paid media. So I know um, there are some Spanish language media, cannot remember the radio station or two radio stations that were mentioned. Um, I think... There was an urban media station. I think it was Hot 93, but I'm not 100% sure. I, have, I don't, um, don't remember what the deck said. So we'll be using some of those. But I know there's other sort of internet, like energy radio and some other places that I want to get into. Mm -hmm. And so for COVID, we'll expand that to include some of those stations as well. Uh, yeah, please let me know the ones you want to, you know, like the energy radio and people like that. I really need to, um, you know, trying to see who you're using for your... Uh, for your, your social media, um, yes, to see how involved are, are they with urban uh communities? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, the Latino way has their their the, the go between with the, with the buying as well. So, they've been reaching out to their partners and are open to new partners. So, you know, they said if you have other people that you need to bring to us, so I know like Energy Radio was one. Um, and there were a couple of smaller stations that I wanted to bring into the fold as well. So we'll we'll be expanding that. So for flu, it's much more targeted because we're going to focus more on COVID. But um, this flu campaign that will be uh, running in the next week will give us some insight into how to do COVID even better after this. I just want to thank you so very much for the wealth of information sharing that you have done tonight. You have made me feel a lot more comfortable um, as I speak to people and they want to know what is hard for plans are. So I just want to thank you for the personal time we have taken away from your daughter to educate <laughs> us. Um, because, you know, people are asking as we're out there and, you know, um, getting up more after the holidays now, you know, um, just keep, um, came on from one of my NRZ meetings you know, and they're asking, you know, what are the plans? What is Hartford plans? So this has given me a wealth of information so I can share back with my uh, my NRZ meeting, which I will attend. So thank you for your time. You. I really, really appreciate it. Yes. It is my pleasure. And we will, you know, we will in include NRZ as part of this as well. We know that they are leaders and, and you know, have that reach into different parts of the community. So all of these these folks and these places that we all know will be a part of it. We just haven't done a lot of that outreach work right, right now because of where we're at. But over the next couple of weeks, this will evolve and we'll get more information and you know, there's possibility of another vaccine being approved and that will accelerate plans even more. So all of these things impact this this uh, the work that we're doing, but it is, it is my pleasure my team um, is very committed to this, and we we really believe that our niche is reaching those that are um, not are not served by um, the traditional system. Uh, and we want to make sure that those are the folks that we're reaching out to. We don't want to duplicate services. We have uh, we have a lot of great groups here, 
Um, we don't want to duplicate the services that providing. We want to be additive to that. We're in a very different place than some of my colleagues in other parts of the state where they had to do phase 1A. They had to push up and do phase 1A because there's not enough providers in their community to vaccinate everyone quickly. We are lucky enough in Hartford to not have been in that position um, and to allow us here at the health department to really think through what our phase 1B and 1C will look like so that we can capture those people who may fall through the cracks or who often fall through the cracks. Right. So um, I have a, a, a question, um, Director. The you, you mentioned earlier the importance of having community leaders and in particular politicians um, take the vaccine. Is there any kind of campaign or plan? I know I had a, a couple of colleagues here text me saying that they'd be willing to take the uh take the vaccine um, if needed. Is there any kind of media plan or plan that you guys have in place for the council members who do want to take the vaccine publicly? So um, it, it'll depend if you, all, if you all fall under group 1C or 1B or 1C. But the I think we're like group C. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, well, you know, municipal. municipal I think we're 4F. We're 4F. Uh, <laughs> there's I don't know about you, John. Continuity. <laughs> I'm going to use my age to move up to the one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, even myself, I personally struggled with, um, you know, do do I fall into into one A or not? Um, but because we, I will be working vaccination clinics, I think those of you that know me know that I'm a very hands-on director, and I want to know uh, exactly how things run. And so, um, as Councilman Clark knows, I've been out at testing sites with my team, um, you know, helping, providing information, and so I will be the be doing the same exact thing for COVID. And so as soon as uh, as soon as we're able to get vaccine doses in here, you know, it is my plan to get vaccinated publicly with my nurses um, in, in phase 1A as I will be assisting um, doing intake and things like that as part of vaccination clinics because it is all hands on deck. Um, and so as more phases open, we will most definitely, I think it's really important to, to do that. Thank you. Well, just let us know. Like I said, we do have some volunteers, uh, myself included, um, you know, so we're more than willing to do that. Um, coming, we're coming up on an hour. Um, any other of my uh, colleagues have uh, any more questions? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, Majority Leader. Uh, yes. Uh, through you, I, I would like to say that um, our director is one of the hardest uh, working uh, directors in the city of Hartford. Um, her job is is more than 24 seven, uh, where she has given plenty of her time, effort and energy uh, to balance her work, work life and home life. Uh, as yes, she is, she is a mom, two wonderful um, young lady uh, to make sure that the needs are met uh, to the residents of the city of Hartford. And when, you know, the rubber meets the road, uh, she has continued to uh, show uh, resiliency uh, in addition to uh, working the inner work, navigating through the inner workings of the public health politics. Uh, so we know politics on one side, on our side, mm -hmm. but there is a huge amount of politics on the public health side. And she has uh, been uh, very, uh, very knowledgeable, keen and crafty in a good way of not of navigating <laughs> through that <laughs> to well, make sure I, to make to make sure that you know the, the residents, the community, and the um, business community uh, have have gotten what they need, and so uh, she um, she she has been great. Uh, she deserves the increase, and I hope that the, the mayor can um, put forth an increase in her salary uh, for this upcoming budget uh, because she absolutely deserves it. We are not out of the clear yet, but uh, as you can see. Uh, she's always knowledgeable and up to speed on uh, the issues that are going on pertaining to the public health of our city. So, uh, you know, whatever, whenever we can to assist her and her staff uh, on making sure that folks are getting information regarding this, um, uh, regarding this, the vaccine, over the information, whatever have you, uh, let's really do forces to make sure that she uh, can, uh, you know, continue to work with us and get uh, and help her if she needs it. Sure. I will definitely second that and attest to that. 
I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I, I have an amazing team, and they make my work really easy, and I love my job. I, I can I can say that very honestly. I love the work that I do, and I love working for the city of Hartford. It is um, it is a privilege to do the work that I do and to serve to serve my community. So thank you. I might not have been born and raised in Hartford. I'm a Bridgeport girl, um, but it is it is the same community in many ways, and um, I am very very humbled. Um, to be able to serve to serve Hartford, so thank you. I really appreciate that, Council. Thank you. Um, we have a really good team, and I'm really proud to, to work for for the mayor and for the city council and for this community. Thank you, Director. Thank you very much. Um, so um, there is uh, one other item. We're going to move to item number three, other business. Uh, Director Arroyo, I know you wanted the floor to be able to talk about uh, the senior center, um, particularly the South End Senior Center. Um, you wanted there was a lot of buzz about that uh, center in particular. So I don't know, uh, Director, if you want to just you know give a quick uh, update on that for the community as well. Sure. I mean, first, I I do need to apologize about the the issue um, in terms of the senior center stove and the south end. You know, we we received that information um, and attempted to to work on it and and did got a lot of great forward movement it is you know a special stove and it's a commercial stove and there's specifications and things like that and and basically we you know unfortunately we dropped the ball we dropped the ball um on our end uh you know the senior center wasn't opened and, and we were focused on covid and year end and your close of the books and it fell off the radar um where we're at today is uh, when before the holidays, before Thanksgiving, when we received word um, that we needed to move on it. We just finished submitting earlier today some additional documentation uh, that the finance office has asked us for. And so uh, we have a vendor, we have the paperwork downtown. Um, and so once that PO is open, we'll be able to order. Uh, DPW will install. So uh, I'm awaiting uh, from my colleague some follow-up for tomorrow in terms of how long the process will take. But again, I just just want to apologize um, to to those uh, individuals that were left waiting. No excuse in terms of how long it's taken, and I take responsibility for that, um, and I apologize. So we are trying to close the loop on that, and uh, we hope to have it done within the next week or two. Uh, but I will most definitely um, email you an update, Councilman Lerong, so that you can keep the community informed. Thank you, thank you, uh, and thank you, um, uh, Director Arroyo. As you know, um, you know there's a lot of balls and stuff in the air, and so you know those things happen. So, uh, Councilwoman Surgeon, I just want to follow up on the South End Senior Center. So, do they now have a contract that they've been looking for, also away from yes. the stove yes. issue? Yes, my understanding is I saw contracts come in, and we were asking for invoices. So we had sent, um, we had did, we did re, re, uh, we had re asked for revised uh, budgets because of the additional funding that had been put through. Mm -hmm. There was a little bit of delay. I know we received a, there was a delay. I can't remember which senior center was delayed. Um, but my understanding is I saw contracts come through. So I had asked my team to follow up on invoices. Okay, so they do. So they are going to be I having a contract. I feel confident that they have their contract, yeah. And we were at, we asked for invoices, but let me confirm okay. because that was like maybe three weeks ago that I I believe I saw their contract come through. I know we were waiting. Um, Parkville hadn't submitted a contract yet, and we followed up with them asking where that was, and they just re, uh, submitted their revised budget so that we can tur um, turn their contract back around to them. But we were waiting something from them. Yeah, because I I'll think one of the up. questions I had, I think one of the questions, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think one of the questions I had regarding the contract was the additional funds they were received. Um, was that also placed in the contract or not? Yes, yes, yes. It had been. Yes. So um, we just did a revised budget. Correct. Correct. That, that was one of the things we had started. We started the process a little early asking them to submit. Um, their budget to us, and then when the increase happened, they needed to resubmit to us. And then remember, oh. it goes through MARB, so it went through MARB in September. Mm -hmm. uh, no, was it? I think August or September. I can't remember the timeline, but it did go through MARB because we needed it for the but for the we needed the budgets for that, and so that's where it was. And I believe that had all been taken care of, but I'll confirm. 
I know yeah, that's um, as far as I know, center budget. Yeah, the north end and uh, the south end. Um, next year, um, Councilwoman Surgeon, we have to pivot, but but the north end and south end did get the uh, additional funding. And it was specifically put towards um, payroll. The Correct. To payroll. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. With that being said, um, is uh, does anybody have any other comments? I know Director Arroyo um, has her babies there, um, so <laughs> don't want to hold her that much longer. All right. Seeing no comments, uh, we'll adjourn this meeting, and uh, and we'll see you next month for the next Health and Human Service meeting. Just a reminder: they are every uh, first Monday of the month, and. Um, We'll see you then. Everyone have a lovely evening and a happy new year.